While we're waiting to start, while we're doing our pre-start, um, I'd like to, first of all, welcome everyone um, to What is a Photograph? And this is part of an AHRC grant uh, that uh, Bayad is sharing with LSBU, London South Bank University, uh, with the lead uh, investigator being Daniel, and I'm a co on it, and Daniel Rubenstein. And, um, but it comes under the umbrella of CIFAR, which is our interna International Center for Fine Art Research. And we're very excited about it because um, Christopher, who's hiding in the in Dusseldorf, uh, is going to just say a word or two. Can you can he be heard? No. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, he set up the the website, which you also now can't see. Uh, okay, there he goes. Hi, Christopher. Nope. Test. Okay. Hi, Christopher. You're in front of a very. Hello. I can hear myself. Okay. Well, so <laughs> can everyone else. Um, Anyway, welcome. Christopher is our web designer, and uh, uh, okay, I'm just gonna have to um, mute the live stream, but I cannot hear you through Skype, can which is an issue because there's a big delay with the live stream. So, is the microphone on on the laptop? Uh, I think there is. Is there a microphone on the laptop there, Luke? Oh, okay. Okay. I can hear someone typing. Okay, that's <laughs> that's Luke. <laughs> Um, okay, we're going to do oh, some. Can you? Yes. can you? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, so what we'd like to do is just just give you the um, what the website Johnny says. Oh dear. <laughs> this is going to give you an idea of what is happening with CFAR, and I think the future of um, public dissemination and impact. Uh, each uh, researcher, uh, both within CFAR and externally gets their own page, and anyone um, speaking uh, here today that is either in the audience or uh, at the table uh, will be uh, invited to become a research fellow, either as a research fellow of CIFAR or an associated international research fellow. And we have Grace, who I'd also like to thank. Um, she has done a stellar job in setting this up. If without Grace, this would not be happening, basically. Um, but this gives you an idea of how it works. Um, the, the, you'll have your topics. Everything will be hyperlinked so that um, you can go from. Uh, should, should I say something, Johnny? Yes, say something, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> go on. Okay. Um, sorry for not being there, um, first of all. I tried to be really quick. This is a bit of an uh, impromptu presentation. So, um, <coughs> what I was trying to say, this website, the real idea behind it is um, that everything is interlinked. So I see this website really as a, as a growing archive of the output of uh, CIFA. So for example, everyone was asked to submit their research interests, and for Grace, that was photography, installation, film, authenticity, and archive. Now, not only are these um, idle links, but um, if I bring up authenticity, for example, um, I can see everything that is tagged with authenticity. I'm not exactly sure why this is happening, but... <laughs> you mean why <laughs> there's a blank, yeah. Um, and already you can see that these things are interlinked. So for example, I could never either bring this up, for example, or I could also um, use this to explore. For example, I brought up performance now. <coughs> There is some overlap with um, Henry's profile. So we could go here. And the idea really is that when there's enough content in, um, that people will not only be able to um, use this in one dimension, but they can also say, for example, I want to look for every bit of research that CIFA has done that is both dealing with photography and authenticity. Or I want to look for podcasts that are linked both with authenticity and um, photography. 
So this is the very basic idea. I can say something more about media editing and other things, if you like. No, no. <laughs> it's great, uh, but I think that um, I think that people have a general idea, and I think that they um, would like to say thank you. And um, then we're going to start our conver our international conversation. Is that okay with you, Chris? Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Okay, and now we'll begin at the beginning again. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for coming. Uh, there are people that are situated throughout the academy, uh, or throughout the school, um, uh, at different places where they can see. So they're, they're, not everybody's in this room. There's some in the office, there's some in the cafe, and there's some places dotted throughout Birmingham. So we're just testing out how this works across the city. Uh, but in any case, uh, first I want to thank the AHRC for allowing us to, or for giving us the opportunity to create a network on photography. And I'd also particularly like to thank Daniel Rubenstein and Andrew Dudney uh, for being um, particularly uh, hands-on about this um, project. Uh, we've been wondering for so long, um, there's been a big debate happening, as all of you know, about the question of representation and non-representation and whether or not it's virtual and whether or not it's real. And uh, we've decided to um, really investigate this question by having two um, major conferences. One was held in April in uh, London South Bank and one will be held at CIFAR in May, um, at the end of May and they'll be the bookends, and in between that are two international conversations, and this is one international conversation, first international conversation, and it's part of a sort of more general thing, uh, a series of simple questions, and our simple question today is, what is a photograph? I think that, uh, I think it's about time we actually really just ask something very simple like that. And so we've asked uh, basically people from around the world to um, be interlocutors, presenters. Uh, you are, we're, we have a table situation, but uh, it's all one big table. You're all sitting at the table. This is kind of like the, the King Arthur table, very large sense of table. Um, so please don't feel that it's just simply, um, you know, just all talking heads um, or whatever like that. Uh, Brett at the back, thank you, Brett, so much. Uh, he's our live stream person. Uh, and a thank you also to Luke, uh, who's also um, both an MA student at Media Arts Philosophy Practice and also uh, been doing a lot of the setting up as well. And also Anna Rutter, who uh, is secretly here as someone other than Anna. Or maybe you're secretly here as Anna <laughs> and not as a technician, as per usual. Okay, um, and then also thanks to John Butler, uh, as per usual. He, he's the head of school and has been essential in this situation. Now, what I'd like to do is uh, begin the conversation by asking a couple people to throw out some ideas. And the first person, uh, the first four people that are going to be giving some ideas, so you just have a sense, and then we'll take a little bit of a breather, is going to be, we'll start with Andrew, Andrew Dudney, um, and then we'll go to Brendan Walker, then we'll go to Andrea, and then we'll go to Darren, just so you have a sense of this. Uh, and then we'll have a little break. At any point that the speakers feel is OK, <laughs> all point <laughs> uh, um, then please, uh, please jump in, because like I said, it's a conversation. Andrew, um, how would, Andrew is a professor of photography, is that? No, not that. No. no, historical and cultural studies. Yeah, cultural studies. Cultural studies. There you go. Uh, at London South Bank, and is um, a primary mover in this field. And so we were we're very happy to have him. And Andrew, if you would like to, yeah, um, Should I speak from here you speak from wherever you'd like. Yeah. Brett, can you hear him from there? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Luke, how how can we operate the uh, slides? Okay, well, um, thank you for 
for inviting me here this morning. Uh, there's two reasons I'm really pleased to be here. One is that um, I was involved with Daniel in writing the AHRC uh, grant for the network, and it was great that we got it. And um, uh, up till now, it's done some really good things, and so I have really high hopes for the photography network, uh, upon which I think we can build um, other and further projects, uh, probably around this question, what is a photograph? Uh, the second reason I'm very pleased to be here is because I haven't been here since 19, in this space, since 1968, when I was a postgraduate painting student at Birmingham College of Art, as it was then. So this wow. is kind of a big circle to be back here this morning. It only really hit me when I came in the, <coughs> the doors. The only difference is you can't smell the linseed oil and the turpentine uh, anymore. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do very briefly, and it's about 20 minutes, is it? That's fine. Yeah, 20 minutes, um, is uh, pull out a kind of hypothesis that comes from uh, a chapter that I've just finished called Curating the Image in Network Culture, which is in a book that's uh, edited by Martin Lister that's coming out next year called The Photographic Image in Digital Culture, which is interesting because Martin edited uh, a book of the same title, uh, which was published in 1996, um, of which I had an essay in that. So there's also a kind of revisiting 17 years later of um, what actually has happened uh, in that period of time to our thinking about the photographic image uh, in digital culture, but now I think it's probably um, you know, the digital image in network culture. Okay. Um, so the other part of what I want to say this morning really does relate to somebody else who's here this morning, which is Katrina Slewis uh, sitting behind me, who is the uh, first digital curator at the Photographer's Gallery in London, which relaunched earlier in the year uh, with a uh, video wall. It's called The Wall Project. Uh, and Katrina was very keen to put that project on a kind of research basis rather than simply an exhibition and programming basis. And the first show... Uh, that Katrina launched the wall with was um, this exhibition, and she invited me to make this kind of GIF, um, in which I made this image um, using my iPhone and my iPad. Um, it seemed to me it was the first and last kind of photograph. Um, anyway, this is, I'm really trying this out in a very quick period of time, but it seemed to me, and I was going, I think, against the grain here, maybe, I don't know, but I was being sort of counterintuitive in saying that the hypothesis I wanted to float was that a photograph is a collective act. Um, but I think, obviously, everything then turns on what you mean by collective. Uh, and I don't mean collective in the way we understood it in 1968. Uh, I don't think I mean collective in the sense that we uh, identify that as a known group in something called society. Uh, for me, the, uh, the collective act is something I've been working through from uh, Bruno Latour's work on actor network theory. Um, so the whole idea that a photograph is part of a network um, is an actant, the footnote there, uh, in a chain uh, between humans and objects. So, you know, the collective is problematic here uh, for me, and it's problematic because... Um, because we have a problem with the system of representation. Um, I don't expect you to read all this text, but this is um, Giorgio Agamben. Um, and he, following kind of Foucault, is really talking about uh, apparatuses. And I think it's probably quite important this morning that we see representation not in the narrow uh, art historical or even image sense, but that we see representation as a much bigger kind of system by which humans organize thought and knowledge um, and then you know, begin to institutionalize that uh, and build uh, a kind of a system of representation. So for me, representation is it's political, it's educational, it's knowledge-based, um, as well as the more specific sense in which we might talk about it in relationship to photography. Uh, Agamben talks about it as an apparatus, so I'm happy to think representation apparatus. Um, <coughs> Uh, now, I love this, this quote from Bruno Latour, and I'll read it, uh, when he says, We are no longer sure about what we means. We seem to be bound by ties that don't look like regular social ties. Thus, the overall project of what we are supposed to do together is thrown into doubt. 
the sense of belonging has entered a crisis, and to follow these new connections, another notion of social has to be devised. It has to be much wider than what is usually called by that name, yet strictly limited to tracing new associations and to, and to the designing of their assemblages. So for me, this gets a bit closer to the kind of provocation that a photograph is a collective act, um, because it's not a known collective, but it's a collective that um, has to be discovered by a tracing of the kind of the work that the image does within, uh, within a network. Um, now, that is how I try to take this up. Again, very boring for you to see all this text up here. Um, just highlighted the fact that I'm sure most people this morning will talk about, um, you know, the photograph as a contrary object, really. Now, I mean, this is why, presumably, we're here this morning, uh, because the photograph uh, is, as I call it, uh, both singular um, in distinction. We still like to think of and think we know what a photograph is, and yet at the same time, you know, photography is something to do with the general reproductive system and therefore is very diffused. And so you have this tension between something which is singular and something which is um, diffused and therefore kind of less known. Um, and it's this that right now in what I think of as the, a very heightened moment of convergence around the digital screen that presents new questions of photography's authorship and cultural authority. And this is a particular interest of mine um, coming out of some work I've been doing in museums. Um, this is what we all know. Anybody here this morning could have said this. The photograph in computing has become mutable, fugitive, fleeting, and restless. It is bound in its boundless qualities. It is repetitive and replaceable. Now, it's this that it seems to me we're grappling with. Mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 um, and we might even say, I think as Johnny mentioned just now, it is the synthetic in uh, Scarequake's quality of the hyperreal, which is the technical product of non-photography. Um, and I think it's very interesting that you've got a philosophy um, interested in uh, talking about non-photography, whilst at the same time, in the, in the kind of practical world, the world of non-philosophy, um, you've got something that is fugitive uh, and that we're much, much less sure of. Um, I don't think you arrive at the idea of non-photography, um, and Larawell certainly doesn't, from the practical world. He arrives at it from, actually, from philosophy. Although that's a, that's a point of an argument, I think. It is a point of an argument. Just yeah. want to mention yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> And anyone can we'll, jump in as well. We'll do this. Um, okay, so uh, these, you know, this is a very, very general uh, kind of attempt to sketch something out. Uh, it seems to me that we might just look at... Uh, this. Is there an embedded <coughs> video in this one? Yeah, should be. yeah, there we go. This is uh, an animation uh, by Susan Sloan that Katrina showed in the um, second exhibition at the Photographer's Gallery, which was uh, in July and August of this year. Uh, this is Mary, who is uh, Susan Sloan's mother. Um, and it kind of raises the question of, you know, what are we, what are we looking at? Um, I think conventionally we see it as, you know, as an animation, as a computer animation. Um, but it struck me that through this kind of, <coughs> this moment of technology, you had Mary could not uh, look at the, the camera anymore. You know, there is no camera there in a sense. This is motion capture, um, and in that sense, um, Mary is lost to us because the, the, all those links, whether it's through the index, through the lens, have, have gone. And indeed, the relationship between the sitter and the photographer is no longer there. Um, this is all a kind of, uh, a kind of construction in, in a kind of post-production. Uh, post um, and somewhere in this, I think, are questions about the, this thing around non-photography um, but also, I think this, the idea that I'm trying to hold out of photography as a collective act is, is still kind of present. You know, in one sense, photography, since Joe Spence, has been thinking about identity. Photography has, um, you know, been co-opted in relationship to um, kind of struggles around representation. Mm -hmm. And you could say that Susan and her mother are still in that kind of relationship of representation. 
in kind of making this image. But at another level, you know, Susan's mother has become a kind of um, not a human. You know, she is yeah. something else in this. And yet the code of representation still exists. And I think this is something we do need to talk about today uh, between a theory that actually leads us to the idea that photography is now something to do with a machine, to do with computing, and therefore is non-human in that sense, whilst at the same time the way we uh, have to understand not only the way we read this image, but the person who made it and the relationship with her mother is still within the codes of representation. Um, and of course, the real place of all this is uh, is on the network and is uh, what we're doing with our iPhones and iPads and tablets. Um, and it seems to me that it's in this kind of flow of the image that these that there's another way of seeing really what was happening at a, at a very higher technical relationship between Susan and Mary in that animation um, between anybody who... Um, is kind of dealing with images in the network. Um, okay, I think probably I'm going to get close to the end of my time here. But um, so where this interested me was that, of course, all of this is a kind of challenge to um, the established codes of representation. It's also a challenge to the whole archive of photography, and it's a challenge to. Um, or it problematizes or troubles. It's, it's, a, it's troubling about what we think a photograph is and how we use photographs. Uh, and somewhere in these tools, these digital tools we have on the one hand, um, and the cultural codes of representation on the other, um, that's the space of this, this kind of troubling. Um, because photography is still uh, part of reproduction. Now, it's interesting being in an art school here. Um, in a sense, the, I don't think the digital can be embraced easily by art school culture. Um, I don't think it can be embraced by the museum. I'm, I'm very interested in the way tech modern is trying to grapple with the digital, and I think it's not doing a very good job because um, what I've been uh, briefly showing you or touching upon um, is because photography is this diffused <coughs> act of representation as much as it persists as this uh, singular kind of image. And however many deaths photography has, however many undoings of photography, it persists as photography. And that is a kind of a paradox. Um, but in that kind of paradox, it seems to me that right now the museum and possibly arts, the art schools have accepted <laughs> photography as art, mm -hmm. uh, but very much um, in its kind of analog kind of mode, it seems to me, that what, the, what is much harder to do is to accept photography as the network, to, to accept photography as something that is diffused and is part of the actions between actors uh, and objects. Um, okay. So uh, is it fair to say then that photography owes a debt, has a debt, that it carries a debt, and at the same time is moving into the sort of surface environment, <coughs> this, this network surface environment, is, is that what you're saying? Well, I think what I'm saying is not in that sense new. I mean, Walter Benjamin always, of course, pointed out that, um, you know, that photography as reproduction changed the function of art. Yeah. Um, and here we are again, appearing to repeat this kind of moment in another revolution, the, the, the moment of the digital. Um, and you could say that yet again, you know, what cannot be grasped within the notion of representation is reproduction. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, what so, um, uh, so okay, this, I'll finish here. The paradox produced by the circulation of what stubbornly refuses to be anything other than the photographic image in digital culture is that whilst the screen transmission produces something other than a photograph, its precise effect in everyday life is to make the photographic image more present and saturated. Um, and, in, and then my little comment to myself, um, and in this way mask the um, masks or conceals the durational, the processual, and the interconnectivity which the image performs. I mean, in a sense, this kind of goes all the way back um, to one of the things that Marx grappled with, which mm -hmm. is, you know, how is labor present within the commodity? You know, and if we think of the image as a commodity, then, you know, if you unpack that, then the work that, that, that humans do in relationship to the network is clearly a kind of cultural labor. 
um, but of course it's masked you know, by the image. And the more you fixate on the image, the less you'll understand that the photograph is a collective act. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure. Can um, just say who you are? Oh, I'm Sarah Edge. I'm from, um, I'm a professor in photography and cultural theory. And Wait, I'm, can you speak low? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's, we, we thought the mic would pick it up, but it's not picking it up. Um, I'm Sarah Edge, and I'm a professor in photography and cultural theory. And um, I deliver photography in media, media and communications, which is probably slightly different than a lot of people. But I was interested in the um, concept that photography persists, actually. And um, is there, does it persist because there's a kind of, there's a, a, a cultural and human need for the photograph and what the photograph offers? Do you think? Well, the point I think we're grappling with from 2000, which was something that Lev Manovich, um, in the language of New Media, posed, which is the distinction between um, uh, the cultural layer and the computer layer. And the, the fact is, we don't and can't go around speaking algorithms. You know, we can code, and we have kind of people who know code, but we can't speak code. So we speak, this is how we post it, you know. As yet, we do not have a language that um, at the cultural level allows us to understand what the computer is doing. Which is why I think since Manovich for the last 10 years, a load of people have disappeared into software studies. Because there, that's where they say, it's in the coding of the software that you will find the new, um, the new logic, uh, the new coding of those conventions. So something's coming apart, I think, between the persistence of the cultural trope of representation on the one hand, uh, but our inability to actually interface with code on the other. Introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I'm Everyone knows what is uh, director of ICON. You talked about the with Mary and Susan yeah. you know, and the way that this image had, had um, sort of departed from from you know any kind of human identity. And yet you said it exists within the codes of representation yeah. of photography. And it would be it's the definition of those that interest me. I mean, where, I mean, how is it still there within the codes of representation? How do you see it there? I mean, do you recognize it? Yeah. Um, <coughs> is it simply something that you recognize, you know, you simply yeah, see? Good point. Um, oh yeah, what are we actually seeing? Well, I think the problem is it's always contextual because um, <laughs> Katrina introduced me to Susan standing in front of the wall. And in that conversation, she told me it was her mother. So to that extent, you know, what was going on was my induction into what I was seeing. So for me, it was highly contextual, I think, at that point. And then I learned about how Susan, who um, is head of, uh, is that right? head of animation in um, Bournemouth, um, you know, how she came to make this image. And for her, she was interested in the software. If you spoke to, if she were here this morning, she would talk very much about um, the things that the software does that are the mistakes in the software. Mm -hmm. So it's not about rendering it all in this smooth um, form of, say, the, the commercial animation that you use, um, because then you probably wouldn't recognize these. It's through the mistakes, it's through things that the software does, Susan says, mm -hmm. that you see this, this kind of dis, this different code going on, the, the bit that I'm trying to say has departed from a cultural because if it were the cultural convention, it would be sitter, photographer, mother, daughter, um, and some, some, something that was happening you know, through the lens of the camera. Um, whereas this was you know, composited you know, from uh, motion capture data uh, and rendered subsequently. It's a really interesting fine line. You yeah. know, you know yeah. that you, you sort of move over it, and then all of a sudden you're in within the realm of this code of representation. Yeah. And I mean, it's yeah. maybe not something for us to develop here today, but it's so interesting for me in relation to the idea of um, photorealism. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, which is coming yeah. back into yeah. fashion now. And you know, is there some kind of connection between what you're talking about? You know, the mistakes of the machine, the yeah. weird mutations, and the very flawed human translation of photographic yeah. source material. Actually, we are developing that today. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Give it the <laughs> longer you see this, and if you certainly see it at much higher definition as it was displayed in the photographer's gallery, 
You know, you, if you after a while you think you are definitely looking at something other than a human, it's more like yeah. an animal, um, you know, or another species. Yeah. So yeah. Mary's mother becomes something other than um, the, the, the the representation, European representation of home would have it. So there's no, mm. it, it undoes the humanism, it undoes the um, a lot of the cherished ideas about what we think representation does. One last question, and then we're going to move to Brendan. Yeah. And just say who you are. Did everybody hear that? Rob yeah. Gibbs. Quick <laughs> question. Okay. Photography, visual, and communications at BCU, at BIAD. I'll speak to you. Thank you. If someone comes up and asks me for the differentiation between what we see here as an animation, constructed, conceived, and predetermined to put in place someone's ideas, in this case the author, how is that different from a photograph in terms of the relationship between the subject and the sitter? Or is it? I don't know. Um. I'm sorry to say this. Can you repeat the question? Sounds <laughs> 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 like a really good question. <laughs> what I'm saying is, if someone says, what's the difference between an animation that's been constructed, oh, yeah. okay. if necessary, a storyboard in relation to the relationship between the sitter and the subject, in this case, Mary and her daughter. Yeah. How is that different, or is it different in any way, from the subject relationship that a photographer with a piece of stills equipment has yeah. recording and getting across the intentions or the perceived intentions mm. of that particular creative photographer, originator in some form? I, don't yeah. know if it is, but I think it's a good question, and I don't think I can answer a huge amount of it, and I think it's uh, something that Susan would uh, offer us a lot more about. But what I would say, is that this, um, the reason I kind of brought it to, sh to show, thinking it would do to show some of these kind of problems, is because I think there is a kind of, um, and this sounds a bit like very conventional, the, the, the remediation of those analog forms. I mean, there was animation for 100 years, there was photography for 100 years, there was film, all of which had on analog kind of means. Um, but what you see here, and what we can see here, um, is something that is a kind of, both a convergence of those through you know, digital code, but also a kind of remediation of their cultural form. So on that sense, this, um, you know, the confusion at the cultural layer is that, you know, yes, we could be looking at an animation that in it could have been made analogically anywhere in the last 100 years, but we're not. You know. um, equally, it has, uh, through its rendering of surface, lots and lots of uh, photographic quality that, of course, code gives it. So I think it's convergence. I think for me, from the point of view of looking at it for seeing it for the first time, um, the notion that there's no eye contact that is really yeah. in the sense of, it is. sense of time is something that appears or could appear to be consciously <coughs> put into the image to elicit a response from us. Oh, okay. In much of the way someone has said, yeah. look at that in the photograph. Yeah, yeah. So that could have happened, yeah. Okay. Um, now, we, now, this is going to be a building conversation. So, um, so now Brendan leaves. That's why I'm leaving. Okay, um, I'd like to introduce you to Brendan Walker, who um, suddenly is. Maybe we should speak amongst ourselves now. Sorry. So, um, Brendan is um, quite a brilliant. Uh, well, uh, he's a, a performer, he's a photographer in his own right, he's a, he's a theorist, he works on questions of thrill. And uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of thrill yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, let's get it launched. So, um, I can just not start that flame and we'll be. Do you need to remove the strange <coughs> object? Oh, this one, yes, mate. What is this? These just appeared in the academy. Someone made them, oh. and they appeared everywhere. It's not you, yet. Um, <laughs> no, in this. Sorry. It's a true. Yes, yeah, check it. I'll show you this in a minute. It's this machine, it's an auto portrait machine. Now let's see. So I'm going to start off with um, so I've got a set of slides, I have to say, um, slightly sound, so I usually like to see what slides coming up next, but I can't, so it's gonna be a little bit void to discover for me, so please bear with me. Um, so my I was wondering where to start with my relationship with photography, and actually uh, comes back to a, probably a publication 
in fact, two publications I wrote, very small, uh, which were the result of an AHRC-funded project, which was called uh, Chroma 11, Engineering the Thrill. And, sorry. A little slower. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, the taxonomy of thrill, um, basically, my background is originally as an engineer, then as a designer, and then also as a practicing artist. And the ta I wrote the taxonomy of thrill as a blueprint for designing, uh, to help me design and create more thrilling uh, performances, installations, sculptures. And it was a, the culmination of a, of a year's research which really used, borrowed a lot from criminology and interviewing people who have their own thrilling experiences. And, but I won't go into that in too much detail. In fact, I'm going to skip straight to. Um, Actually, here we go. It's an appendix. Um, and because I come from an engineering background, I was fascinated by the idea of being able to quantify the thrilling experience. Could I use science to, um, to determine how thrilled somebody was when they went on a roller coaster, when they were having great sex, whatever? Was there, was there a way of rating this? And essentially, through my um, studies through my, my interviews with people, I came up with this, this form, and all this basically says that you will get a sensation of thrill when there's a rapid and large increase in pleasure and arousal. So V is actually the, the psychologist term for, for pleasure, which is valence and arousal. So if there's a rapid and large increase in, in pleasure and arousal, you get uh, a sensation of thrill. And this actually plays out in, a, in one of the simplest ways of scientific terms of, of articulating or describing thrilling ex uh, emotional experiences in two dimensions, both on pleasure and arousal, you can fairly much map most emotional experiences within that space. So I was basically developing a language for being able to describe uh, thrilling experiences. Now that, at the time I wrote that, that was really a, a placeholder for me to try and understand my own work and how to uh, grapple with the ideas of designing new rides. Uh, so I was also making my own work, but also consulting for theme parks. But it, at the time, it tied in with this biography I, I read from a guy called Keith Nichols, who owned his own um, fairgown ride, an old mechanical ride. And he talked about uh, the way he looked at people's faces on rides and he would determine whether to go faster or slower depending on whether people were screaming, whether they were looking like they weren't enjoying themselves, you might go a bit faster. And there was this natural kind of biofeedback. He was basically understanding facial expressions and controlling his machine in response to that. So there was some relationship going on there between face and, and machine. And this was actually some of my own experiments on fairground rides in Greece, actually. And at the same time, I was, so whilst writing the taxonomy of thrill, I was putting myself through increasingly more thrilling experiences. This was a skydiving accident, which didn't have a very happy end. I was seeing an osteopath for two years after this photograph was taken. Um, but I was interested in my own experience of thrill, and also, again, I paid somebody to come down and photograph me as I was skydiving. And I was just interested in the relationship between pleasure and, and arousal and thrilling experience. And it was around, I think, 2005 that this, I came across the work of Paul Ekman, who was, I suppose, the grandfather, well, actually, no, Darwin would be the grandfather of, of understanding facial expressions, but it, obviously Paul Ekman developed the work more formally in the 70s. And this idea of being able to uh, decode facial expressions uh, formally and to understand and get an insight into the emotions that were being experienced. Um, and that also, so that was actually looking at expressions of pleasure, which actually tied into my, my formula I was interested in. But also the idea of arousal, uh, this sort of, sort of very visceral activation of the body, um, the, the activation of the heart, the lungs, sweating, pupil dilation, uh, again tied into my equation, so I was both looking at facial expressions as an idea of pleasure, looking at the activation of the body as an indication of arousal, and 
It was that time that I met a scientist at Media Lab Europe, uh, which is part of MIT, it was an MIT spin out in Dublin, uh, a scientist called James Condren, who was developing uh, games for children with attention deficit syndrome. And he introduced me to um, this piece of technology, which is um, so these little sensors which you wear on your fingertips, and basically it's galvanic skin response. And when you send, uh, when your body goes into a state of arousal, your skin pores open up, and your body can conduct electricity more efficiently. And it's a really good way of looking at uh, being able to monitor levels of arousal. And I proposed a project to the Wellcome Trust, which is called Punter's Auto Portraits of Fairground Thrill. And the idea was that this machine, which was essentially a, a body-worn camera, the machine would be developed to take a photograph at peak moments of arousal. So the idea, I'll show you some photographs from it. The wearer would wear it here, camera looking at the face. And <coughs> it would take a photograph only at the peak moment of arousal. Mm -hmm. And the camera I chose was a, a 35 millimeter camera. I didn't want to use a digital camera. I wanted a camera which could only fire once during the experience of riding a fairground ride, which would produce what I believe to be, I suppose, that single moment of intense arousal and it would capture the facial expression. I was interested if there was a correlation between pleasure being expressed on the face and that moment of arousal. So as I say, the, the galvanic skin response, so this is actually a bit of technology, so this shows these, these kind of peaks I'm talking about. So basically, the camera was being triggered at these kind of peaks here, highest moments of arousal. <laughs> the, the equipment itself was actually really important to me. So coming from a design background, um, to kind of aestheticise the equipment, I mean, even appearing with myself in a red boiler suit, um, harked back to uh, my love of the Red Devils when I was a little kid, and this idea of adventure and thrill-seeking. But also the ergonomics of trying to get the equipment correct, and, and actually starting to play with, this is actually a very, you know, this piece of equipment has to be able to withstand the rigours of 4.5G, has to pass health and safety regulations, but also has to deliver um, the photograph itself has to be of a good quality. We'll come into what that means in a moment. So I tested also, so I spent quite a while riding a motorbike, firing the, firing the camera mechanism with my mouth, um, trying to get all those aesthetic qualities which I believe needed to be in the photograph. Because actually these photographs really, I wanted to be emotive, I wanted members of the audience, because the intention was to create single photographic prints from the single negatives and to exhibit those uh, in an art context in the gallery. And I wanted people, the audience, um, to find them emotive. I wanted them to empathise with the characters in these photographs. So the aesthetic quality of the, not only the lights, so the, a very long exposure with the lights moving in the background, but then also uh, the ring flash capturing that single moment of intense arousal on the face of the, the, the subject, the wearer. So in these experiments, I was just using a manual trigger. And again, more explorations about the equipment and how it might look like. It was sort of looking a little bit more like skydiving equipment. So again, developing the language. In fact, even the, the briefcase became a very important part of the performance of taking the photographs, of turning up at uh, a fairground of explaining to people what this piece of very technical apparatus did uh, and also them feeling like there was some kind of uh, thrill adventure seeker on these rides. So finally, it's, 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 it's finished. In this bag here contains the, uh, the equipment for the flash photography. It also contains the microelectronics needed to decode the arousal being captured by the, the finger sensors. As I say, the, then the sort of aestheticisation of the, the, the or fetishisation maybe, of the, 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 the camera equipment itself was quite important to me. Um, and so for four months during 2006, 
I followed George Irving's fairground around the south of England, um, enlisting members of the public, friends, colleagues, to, to be my sitters on the right. The photographs themselves, I think, um, are ambiguous to an extent. Um, I have to say that the, the single shot camera never happened. Um, the camera did take multiple photographs on the ride, um, so that's my first confession. Uh, none of these are single moments. Uh, there was a process of maybe from each sitter, uh, maybe triggering the camera 15 times on average. And there was a process of, of editing. So my, my idea of um, what constituted um, an appropriate photograph for what I was, the story I was trying to tell, or the emotions I was trying to elicit in the viewer. So this one, I think uh, the ride was, uh, I think it was Midnight Express. And there's a certain uh, air of, of, um, uh, of um, mania, I think, being expressed <laughs> in this photograph. But this is all my own reading. In fact, it's down to you to, to decode, I suppose, what's in there. But there are moments which are obviously tending towards delight and others which tend towards horror. And in fact, some of these photographs, and I wish I could remember the artist's name from the 1960s, but there was an artist who took photographs of couples uh, during sex and took portrait, very tight portraits at moments of orgasm. And those photographs were shown out of context, in fact, with, with, with um, or exhibited with, with no context at all, um, uh, no description of where those photographs had come from. And it was reported in the press that people thought that they were snuff photographs. So they were supposed to be high, moments of intense pleasure and arousal. In fact, they looked like moments of horror and pain and distress. And I was kind of interested in that relationship that was coming out through the photographs as well. And moments of bliss. So this collection, I actually feel strange because actually I was going to bring the actual photographic prints, so now I've digitised them and I'm showing them on a PowerPoint. It seems wrong. <laughs> this is actually some of the anticipation, some of the waiting to actually get on the ride itself. In fact, that's actually borne out because a lot of the work <coughs> I do now with the University of Nottingham, with the Department of Computer Science, is very much involved in collection of data uh, around emotional experience, and we found that the anticipation of getting on a ride uh, peak moments of, of a roller coaster only can match about 80% of that intensity of that experience of just about to get on a ride, which is, it's no wonder that, that the camera actually chose or was dictated to, to, to take photo after that moment. So I'm just going to um, move on to maybe just five minutes of showing where this practice is kind of led. So that was the auto portrait machine, but the, the, the scientific, the, the, the relationship that my work had with science um, has increased. In fact, I was asked to produce a festival at the Science Museum um, in 2007, which was very much based on the auto portrait machine, the technology that I'd developed, the relationships I had with both scientists, artists, and performers. And I staged over a, a month. Uh, a series of experiments at the Science Museum which, which pushed, so this is actually early concept drawings, but basically I brought Fairdown Rides into the museum and my proposal was to upgrade from a, a single 35mm shot to a constant, persistent video stream. In fact, do we have uh, audio on my laptop for a bit? Brilliant, thanks. Um, and the idea of how to embed, I was quite interested in the idea of, of metadata, in fact, a lot of the work I'm doing with the University of Nottingham now is how to embed scientific data into both alongside audio and video streams. So now we have you know, audio-visual, we now have bio-audio-visual data streams which we're developing. But trying to create a language for describing an emotional experience by taking heart rate, breathing, to create a, 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 a graphic overlay which would add to this portraiture, which is obviously incredibly important for people to be able to understand human emotion. And the idea of the performance and conducting experiments evolved 
the equipment evolved. Um, and in fact, just play a short video from one of the sitters at the Science Museum. Um, the video quality is very poor, it's analog video broadcast over analog uh, radio. Um, the, the data, which you see heart rate at the bottom, uh, we've got um, accelerometer at the top, that's all done using analog video mixing. It was all very seat of the pants, but I'll show you the quality of the video. So this is uh, a woman called Sam. She's riding a ride called the Booster, which is a ride which is like a giant windmill, and you tumble forwards going up to about 80 miles an hour as you go circles within circles. So she starts off seated, but then the ride picks up speed. with communication, with, um, well, sorry, from, from the performance aspects, there were problems with communication, there were breakdowns in communication quite often, video links would fail, but then we embedded that within the performance itself, questions about whether somebody was alive or not, when, when video links were severed, um, which is kind of an interesting aspect. But also, the more um, uh, persistent question which we're tackling is, an audience's understanding not only of, well, we inherently as humans can read uh, emotions in other spaces, but also how to then add this extra layer of scientific data um, so that it doesn't, <coughs> doesn't detract from the portraiture we can see, but adds um, layers of empathy or increases a sense of empathy with the character on screen. Another aspect of the uh, of um, portraiture I continue through my work, the idea of a souvenir photograph. And in fact, this photo is taken from a whole series of pictures at Alton Towers, uh, working with a psychologist, Peter Chapman. Um, and um, he was interested in people faking facial expressions of emotions. So I borrowed language from the old stick your head through the hole, have a photograph taken, during a whole series of these backdrops at various stages on a roller coaster and asked people to take to, to strike a pose which they thought was the appropriate emotion at the time and so they, they served, these photographs served both as souvenirs for the individuals uh, but also as uh, research, scientific research for the psychologists uh, to, to determine whether people could successfully fake facial expressions of emotions. And another aspect, so as I said, I, I make rides. Um, I make, in fact, this particular ride was funded by um, Arts Council. I won't go too much into the ride itself. It's based on an air disaster where there was a cockpit which was uh, at a heady height of three and a half metres above the ground. And there was a performance which lasted for half an hour, uh, at the end of which people got thrown out the back of the aircraft on a zip wire into bright lights. It was very ambiguous. They didn't know that was going to happen. But at the end of the ride, there was a very uh, formal setting, um, almost kind of Victorian in, in the sense that uh, there were props and costumes in this, this idyllic English countryside where people had survived the ride and they were asked to pose um, how they would celebrate the survival of an air disaster. And again, I have several hundred photographs 
all of which are archived intentionally on Flickr, both as, I mean, it, it really as, as souvenir photographs. But again, the range of expressions from people acting dead through to celebrations with friends is quite wide and varied. And the final piece I'll show is um, draws on uh, experiments with um, inspired by uh, Duchenne, which um, kind of interested again in this idea of, of being able to control facial expressions. So obviously, in this image here, this is from a series of photographs using microelectrocution to various muscle groups to try and get the sitter to uh, recreate. Um, emotional expressions and was it possible to recreate them by stimulating certain muscle groups obviously something which I'm incredibly interested in so I created a, a, another portrait machine this time it was for a horror film festival the camera was embedded in one of the arms um, there was a lot of scientific monitoring that went on to accompany the, the, vi the videoing and the facial expressions and the final artefact was actually uh, projected outside the cinema. The idea was that there was an audience watching the, the horror film. Uh, my sitter was sat in the wheelchair parking bay in the, in the cinema auditorium watching the film. But the idea of the projection of the facial expressions alongside scientific data was to give the secondary audience outside the cinema uh, an inkling to the, to the horrors that were being experienced and, and um, by, by the sitter inside the auditorium. The, the data here is intentionally ambiguous. It's, it's almost, well, very 1970s. It, it draws on the idea of seismographs. You're kind of not entirely sure what's going on, but there's a constant stream of emotional experience clearly being uh, had inside the auditorium. Uh, but the unusual thing was that watching horror films, facial expressions very rarely change. It's almost like a, a, a static shot. And compared to roller coasters, that's kind of that's something that's kind of intrigued me, that there's a, some internalisation of emotional experience whilst watching film, as opposed to sort of slightly more sort of visceral experience of, of being involved in a roller coaster ride. And so what next? Well, I'm working with uh, a scientist called Michelle... Valstar at University of Nottingham, who's developing, he's, he comes from a, a MIT heritage, he's developing computer algorithms based on the codification of, of facial expressions by Ekman uh, to be able to, in real time, uh, decode and present levels of valence and arousal just from analysing real time video. And for me, Who's doing, I, I'm doing increasingly large amounts in, of work with TV and TV production, so obviously video uh, and constant streams are, are of great interest to me. To be able to decode in real time uh, people's emotions and to add that as another layer alongside video and audio, this layer of biophysiological, psychological data is absolute gold dust to my practice. So this is kind of where I'm spinning off to next. So that's... So I have a, I have a quick question to ask you. Thanks, Robert. Um, so what is a photograph? Good question. So I think that I, I steered... I'm curious. No, no, of course. But for me, what is a photograph? Because you've used photograph as archival, as capture, as uh, ingredient. Yeah. So how do you see a photograph? In my... Let's see, as, as somebody who owns photographs from those personal snapshots or whatever, in my work, I think... Um, Let's say go back to the auto portrait machine. I I saw a photograph originally as being uh, a moment of truth that there was inescapable capture of um, particularly portraiture of of uh, I suppose scientific data in that sense. But also within that, I was kind of not only is it I suppose a, a scientific document, let's say. But it's also, you know, obviously it took great care to control the aesthetics and the, the, the I suppose, the environment with, with, within which that sitter, who, who, I suppose the face contains the scientific data, but then the, the photograph itself as an as a artefact that would 
create empathy in someone. I was kind of interested in that too. So it's both a scientific document, but also I think a medium with which um, I can uh, recreate emotional experience in others. So that's, yeah, so it's like, I suppose like a tool in, in my performance. So like. Andrew wants to jump in immediately. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I have two questions really related. The first part is, you know, what is the relationship between um, the technology you're using to make this, to create the data, mm. uh, and then the, um, the method by which you kind of analyze that? Because it seems to me that essentially you're using a fairly conventional semi semiology mm. of reading which is kind of even, which stays within kind of codes of representation. Yet on the other hand, you seem to want to develop a practice that actually tells us something other than what representation can, can tell us by the addition of data. Mm. So I'm a bit confused. And now you might, it, it seems to me that the, the answer to my own question was that, well, it's an art practice. Mm. But, so that is the answer. It's an answer. Yeah. Answer. yeah. Well, it's a good question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I think you're right. It's, yeah. it's, I think from, from this, this initial piece of work, which is most certainly an uh, art born from an art practice, but the, the kind of work which the, I suppose the video work, which you saw at Ninking of with the helmet, with the camera and stuff, was certainly uh, directed more by scientific inquiry from that, that point onwards. So it became a tool for science, which I was just actually discussing with Andrea coming from the train. But I feel there's been a, I feel slightly hijacked. So I'm more used to now talking about this work at uh, computer science conferences and people from human computer interaction, you know, about uh, how this kind of technology and my practice is, is useful as a way of gathering scientific data uh, from very extreme experience. And uh, I, I feel a little bit lazy as having not actually interrogated this more from my own art practice, which I'm kind of interested to come here and, and throw it open. No, that's brilliant. I think there's something absolutely fascinating about what you're doing. Can you, related, can you hear it? It's, yes. it's related to photography and the essence of photography in that um, to capture an unstaged human emotion um, which it, it seems to me that's what you're trying to do is um, capturing what only a photograph can capture at, at its most basic level in terms of indexicality, recording that. And then I think, and so then you're also playing with people's um, conscious role modeling. And what would be absolutely fascinating is to put your machines onto the viewer and see whether when you've caught that essence of emotion I read it and I react mm. you say, or, and when I look at a photograph where someone's mimicked it, mimicked it in terms of the social codes of I'm scared if I didn't react I think it's absolutely fascinating and I think it has so much actually to tell us about what photography is, what a photograph is, I really do. So it's probably be people that, that have <laughs> <laughs> disagreements with it. Uh, Jonathan, Mattia, and then Rob. Uh, a quick question about this um, reference to art practice. Mm. I mean, what difference uh, really does it make? Oh, I mean, because it was almost like, well, you know, we were sort of going down this um, scientific road and then something, this kind of gap, we kind of explain it and say, well, then that must be your art practice. And you say, yeah. Yes, and okay. what do you mean okay. by that? Because I have yeah, okay. an enormous di question. difficulty with that. Very good question. Okay, so um, I, so my practice, depending on, on who I'm working with, um, I'm sometimes actually cast as being a scientist in, a, in, a, you know, in partnership. And in this instance, with the, the Wellcome Trust, it, it made sense to articulate myself as, as the artist in the relationship with the, with the scientist. But in, in, in reality, uh, my practice um, is truly, I think, um, interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, and I don't actually make a, a, a distinction really between the science and the arts in my work. I think they both inform each other. Um, so I suppose the... Uh, does that answer the question? I'm trying to think. Do I stop there? No, I'm trying to think. Hang on, 
on, Fatia, are you going to amplify that question? Uh, no, it's more of a remark on the first question. Okay, on Sarah's question. Yes. Okay. Um, this, Mattia, can you just say who you are for the camera? Um, sorry? Or for, can you say who you are for the people? I am a PhD student uh, at CIPA. But I mean your actual name. Mattia <laughs> <laughs> Um I found um, an immediate echo between uh, the object of the output of the machine and what we were saying about taking an image also of the company. And with uh, a movie from the late 60s, it was a title I can't remember. It was that, where the, the killer uses a name of the title. Now, there is a complete yeah. circularity in that uh, device that, that here is uh, half in the machine and half in the question. And I was wondering if, since you, you go from trying to document real trivial uh, expressions to the fake ones, to, to something like this that might somehow lift the expression from the real face and then to recreate it in a different environment. If uh, reclosing that circularity and, and showing to your, your, your test of uh, that, yeah. their own expressions might do something for you. Yeah, I think to me, to me there is a kind of problem here because well, you're, 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 you are. Oh, my name is Daniel. Um, your equipment <laughs> has no emotional intelligence. For that reason, it is unable to say when, what people feel, or what, what kind of arousal. So, so you kind of equate something like, a, you have a kind of light, light detector. So when there is you know, high blood pressure, then it pushes the trigger. But you know, that, that assumes the human being as a kind of um, solid, fixed entity that then creates, has certain behavior. And well, you know that, that that is of course a very productive way of thinking about it. That's that very much limits how you consider what being a human being yeah. is. You know, you yeah. could approach it from a completely different way and say it is precisely these desires, these arousals that create the person, that create the subject, and then you will need a very different kind of equipment. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, that that hardwired relationship that I created between those peaks and those very sort of emotive moments is, um, is deeply flawed in a way. And I think there's a whole branch of, uh, and I'll elaborate on that, I think that there's a whole branch of computer-human interaction about uh, trying to, using computer vision, using computer intelligence to understand the emotions. And there are some who come from completely, what, you know, one, one aspect going, as you're saying, uh, everyone's an individual. There is no way you can completely understand, you know, the, the, the human, the, the, the sitter. Right? And then there's the other side, which is going, well, I can certainly monitor something, and I can certainly get it to trigger something. And I, I'm, and I think there's a massive gulf between the two. Um, yet I feel that by plugging in those things and getting it to take the photograph, I think. But then the, the photograph, you know, there was the editing process where I was saying, I wasn't happy with that one because they didn't look quite right or it isn't kind of the emotion or they had their eyes closed. All those, uh, you know, human complications that we all have. Um, I, I was already doing that editing process. But I think there is a gulf, but I think I need to do, it was almost um, holding a, a light up to, to, the, to the scientific community saying, look, this is the result of doing this plug and play. But... It is. There is a mass, I admit there's a massive goal. So yeah. Rob and Katrina and Andrew, and then we'll move on. Yes. Well, mine's a twofold question. Can you shout? <clears throat> mine's a twofold question. <laughs> the first one would be uh, would it be interesting to have someone hooked up who's just making toast or <laughs> boiling an egg or doing something where you get a reaction? That, that's, that's one question. Yeah. The second question is. And it's to do with something you mentioned about two seconds ago, um, the editing process where you're actually intervening and you're blocking out what you think that you may or may not want to see, it, does that in some way reflect a truthfulness of the event or what you expect the, the viewer to in some way get from your truthfulness? Mm. Okay, so the first one, the, the boiling the egg. Um, the reason uh, that this, this machine worked um, the way it did was because 
my interest in thrill is probably the most extreme human emotion, and to be able to capture that with some certainty um, is, uh, you know, it increases sorry, my, my, the probability that I'm going to capture that with some certainty because they're very extreme physiological reactions. And the idea of the subtler emotions are of interest to me, but at the moment I think the, the gulf between the technology and the, the um, maybe that's kind of interesting actually, it becomes more blurred in a, in a sense. I'll, I'll say that because I, um, I'm someone who, if you put me in a, a ride, I would die. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the ride, but you maybe have a much more experience. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, I'm interested in the, I mean, an awful lot of the work I do with, the more research, with my research group at the University of Nottingham is also understanding the individual's, uh, let's say, um, uh, ability to be thrilled or whatever. So basically people have their own thresholds. So it's actually kind of interesting that uh, somebody's experience of a, of a surprise birthday party would be uh, as thrilling as going on a ride, but they couldn't go on a ride because it's too extreme. So I think that, that the, the subjectivity and the differences between the individual is kind of interesting too. Um, the idea of, of editing, uh, I've, so the portrait machine, that was the only time it ever came out, single image. Ever since then, the, the work I've done using video has both been, I mean, you've seen the picture, the archive of, of the work, which is, uh, which is always live. So uh, there is zero editing there. I set up the camera shot. I show it to a local audience of, you know, typically two, two three hundred people. And that it is what it is. And I, sometimes I'll stream it live. Um, so the idea of editing, I think that was the first time. But looking back, again, I hadn't, talking to Andrea on the train coming up, uh, I'd forgotten that whole process of, of making those choices of editing. It wasn't my romanticised idea of the single image being the truth. There was my own idea of what a, an audience might expect to see. So I was looking for examples of extreme experience rather than those slightly more ambiguous moments. So I'm well embedded in that. My own meaning is embedded in all of those choices. Yeah. So what is a photograph and what is human? They're coming to be the same question on some level, at least in the way you're posing it. Katrina? Oh yeah, I was just looking at your, um, what you have up on the screen and reminded of a number of different um, computing science questions. One, one, one research project is called Algorithms in the Wild that I've read about, where, um, you could, where the, they will download, say, 20,000 pho photos of Flickr to train um, facial recognition algorithms and give the data set away for other researchers to develop this technology. <coughs> and so far you've been talking about this um, technology as a way of getting to some kind of truth in relation to the camera. And I wondered if you've really been uh, given any thought to the kind of politics of monitoring and control um, in relation to this kind of technology. Yeah, um, so I'll be truthful. Not a lot, but I know that the, the, the polygraph, I'm just getting to grips with the, the history of the polygraph and the idea of power and control through, um, in fact, how the operators are uh, trained to observe facial expressions in, in conjunction with the physiological monitoring that's going on. And I think in that aspect, I'm kind of interested in that relationship between the sitter and the polygraph expert and that, those relationships there. Um, and also, I think some of the, the format ideas currently developing for TV, um, uh, which are revolving around ideas of lying, deceit, uh, CCTV cameras, but very much inspired both by the polygraph and the panopticon as well, that idea of being uh, observed, one person observing many and, and making decisions or controlling people through that mechanism. So it's of interest, but I, I think it's only just coming out really for me, those, those kind of questions. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Andrew? No, okay. okay, so now we're going to have Daniel, and then we'll take a, a tiny break before we have Andrea and Darren. Uh, we're going to have Daniel basically be like the cat amongst the pigeons, I think, here. Or, anyway, Daniel uh, is head of VA just photography, uh, just a cat, no pigeons. Um, he's head of VA photography at uh, London South Bank. He's the lead investigator on this award and he's also a PhD student here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, basically, I wanted to look at the question for this photograph through uh, reading Deleuze, specifically this book, 
the uh, difference in repetition. And uh, Sorry, which part? Difference in repetition. Now, famously, Deleuze said that his relationship to other philosophers is one of taking them from behind and giving them a kind of monster child. So I was told that as a kind of invitation to do the same thing to the Deleuze. Um, and, um, and to me, photography is precisely the way by which that can take place. So it is a kind of an attempt of a philosophical uh, daisy chaining, I guess, or, or speed roasting, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that Deleuze clearly does not understand photography, and he's not the first one, he's in fact probably the, the last in a very illustrious line of philosophers who did not understand uh, photography at all. And, um, and it is probably because, um, in, a kind of, in a common way of thinking about it, photography suggests a relationship to the world in which the world is perceived as made of pre-given and fixed categories, stable and unchanging matter. So it is interesting why you know photography was such an um, invisible object for Deleuze because he castigates Bergson precisely for not seeing the potential of the, cin the cinematic apparatus. Um, Deleuze, um, for, um, Deleuze identifies these problems in the thought of Bergson. He says, well, Bergson saw the cinematic camera as a kind of reduction of the human intellect, of the human possibility to something <coughs> very mechanical. Uh, very representational and, uh, and linear. And the last comes and says, well, no, because uh, cinema embeds this possibility of multiple points of view on, on one scene, and therefore it puts forward this, this suggestion that, um, you know, you can, you don't need to be attached to the, to the kind of human ego or, or some kind of singularity, but there is always a multiplicity of views that can be actualized uh, for a for a human being, so it is curious for that reason. We don't we didn't see the same potential in the photograph, and in that I think he's very closely following Adorno, uh, considering photography highly reactionary and conservative. So what I want to suggest here is that Deleuze's attitude to photography is not a case of oversight or of unfortunate misrecognition but that understood correctly, it goes to the heart of his philosophical project of difference. Succinctly put, I wish to argue that Deleuze wanted to locate difference in language where it can only exist as a figure of speech, a paradox, or a metaphor. Difference is the condition of language because of the productive tension between expression and designation, between the content of the utterance and the intonation that delivers it. While content can be true or false, Intonation is pure expression. It remains true regardless of whether the statement is true or false. So for Deleuze, language embodies, embodies this productive tension between sense and meaning. And it is precisely this tension that, that, that gives language its creative force. So obviously, it does not see the same creative force, the same parallelism or duality within photography. So thought, worthy of its name, does not put questions of truth about questions of expression, but allows both to coexist as parallel streams. So this is uh, obviously Spinoza's understanding of language. Uh, imageless thought does not begin from asserting that thought will set you free or will lead you to truth. Rather, it is considered as a creative force that produces such notions as true or false, but is not determined by them. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure who did that. Spinoza. Uh, I suppose it's not important here. I just, I no, just, just the just, point. Okay. The, po the point is that for the nurse, language is capable of creativity because it is it has a duality with it. It has a continuous and never resolved tension between expression, which we can describe as the intonation. I can say, you know, unicorn, you know, and then there is a kind of expression to that. Whether unicorns exist or not is a separate question. So language always makes statements regarding sense or emotion, which are parallel for the laws to questions of true or false statement. Yeah? And his main point is that we should, you should never allow questions of true, true or false to dominate questions of sense. They should be allowed to kind of interplay and run, and run freely one uh, kind of next to the other. It is precisely this friction between them 
It creates the possibility of language making something new. And uh, literature is possible precisely because language is capable both of making statements about objects and making statements that just contain sense within them. Okay, so just to, to clarify why this detours through language, because my argument is that this is precisely what Deleuze denies photography to have. For Deleuze, photography only does one thing, only making statements about things which already exist. And that is the point I wish to take issue with. Uh, so, um, so in order to get to imageless thought, Deleuze had to evacuate the image. In this way, the image becomes everything thought should not be. It appears that photography came to be Deleuze's shorthand for everything that is linear, arboreal, and oidipal. In short, <laughs> photography embodies everything that is wrong with traditional ways of thinking. Because, just to clarify Deleuze's terminology, this thought that contains this parallelism of the motion and reason, he calls it imageless thought. Yeah? And that would intrigue me, you know, because clearly if you are so uh, putting forward the idea of the imageless, then the image gets a very bad name. And that's what I'm trying to, uh, to try to rescue. Now, to be fair to Deleuze, photography theorists and critics did everything in their power to ensure that photography would remain the most reactionary form of image making. From Bart, image without code, to Krauss, notes on the index, the list can go on. The idea is always depressingly the same. Everyone knows what it means to look. No one can deny that the photo is a picture of something. It is therefore not surprising that Deleuze understood photography in the same way that other commentators understood it, as representation. Or to put this statement in a political rather than aesthetic perspective, photography is based on the dogmatic idea of the sovereign law of mediation. For that reason, photography can only repeat that which pre-exists and can never bring into being that which does not exist. Yeah? So that's the, the orthodox. Now, in, in the chapter on the image of thought, indifference and repetition, um, when um, Deleuze is quoting Artaud, he says, um, when he commented on Artaud, he says, um, he pursues in all this the terrible revelation of a thought without image and the conquest of a new principle which does not allow itself to be represented. So that's how the notion of thought that has no basis in any pre-given idea of what it means to think or of truth is getting established. So, for the question how one gets to non-representational thought, Deleuze prescribes a healthy dose of schizophrenia. He says, it is not a question of opposing to the dogmatic image of thought another image borrowed, for example, from schizophrenia, but rather of remembering that schizophrenia is not only a human fact, but also a possibility of a thought one moreover, which can only be revealed as such through the abolition of the image. So you can see how Deleuze is actually setting a very simple binary opposition between schizophrenia on the one hand and image on the other. Whether schizophrenia can be considered itself an image, that's kind of what I want to suggest. But isn't it the case, that's my words now, but isn't it the case that schizophrenia is precisely the condition of photography? I am talking here about the multiplicity of repetition. I am talking here about the multiplicity of repetitions engendered in the photographic process, by which multiplicity, uh, by which multiplicity of mechanical reproduction suggests. Sorry, I went a bit wrong. I am talking here about the multiplicity of repetitions engendered in the photographic process. So, multiplicity of mechanical reproductions here suggests that the only thing photography repeats to infinity is the possibility of repetition itself. De-oidipalizing photography means precisely that. The image that photography puts forward is not an image of some pre-existing reality, but of the very possibility of repetition. In other words, I want to contest the basic assumption that underpins writing about photography, which considers photographs to be still images. Such approaches see photographs as transcendent, as images of external things. Against such understandings, I propose that photography is uniquely positioned in relation to difference because it is a creative force capable of creating difference through repetition. The quality of photography that makes it highly conductive 
for a discourse on difference is its ability to repeat through mechanical means that which happened only once. However, it is important to underscore that photographic repetition has two dimensions to it. There is the repetition of an event or a thing that photography repeats by making it into an image. And there is the repetition inherent in the photographic process itself, which allows the photograph to be endlessly repeated. And I think maybe I will shorten it because we is it yeah, I'm finished. Okay, so um, so I just want to give an example. So I don't, I don't want it to sound as if you are know, bringing forward another abstraction. Because my, my charge to Deleuze is that his imageless thought is in danger of becoming an abstraction. And what I want to say is that photography presents imageless thought in the form of an image. So that is the whole point. Now, I, I, I thought that one way of explaining it maybe is um, through MasterChef. Master chef? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, the professionals are just master chef. I think either will do. Uh, because uh, what is happening there is you can see how food does not perform this function of being within the binary of let's say hunger satiation. It's not even part of a binary tasty untaste or good or bad. Simply because we cannot taste any of them. So what? food in MasterChef does, each dish is just a jumping, po a jumping point to the next dish. It's just a place from which you can launch into another direction. So in that way, food loses its connection with this kind of representational rational framework. When you know you're hungry, you eat. It becomes just a possibility of going to another place. Now, thinking about photography in that way, you could say, well, why should we consider Photographs, well, the photographs are clearly images, but why should we consider them as images to be looked at for their content? Perhaps we could look at them for the edge where the image is ending. Perhaps we could look at them for the possibility of moving from one image to the next. It is this possibility of moving from one to the other, of just using the image as a launching pad to the next image, just as, for example, in Schoenberg's music, which is a tone which is not harmonious, which doesn't come to the eye as a sequence within a certain scale, but every sound is just a possibility of going to another sound. And that's, that's the whole meaning, that's the sense, rather than the representation that Schoenberg's sound suggests, that you can just go from it to any other point in the universe. And that is the way I suggest you can look at photography, not as an image of an object, but as a possibility of moving to another image. It is this multiplicity uh, which photography presents to us as an image. That, that, I think, is quite interesting. And if I have another minute, I will just, say, I will just say one more thing. That what uh, is generally ignored by photography theory is that what photography makes visible is precisely the thing that Marx was so struggling with. It's precisely production and labor. In photography, the production of multiplicity or reproduction or making sequences is presented not as abstraction, not kind of disguised or already absorbed within, let's say, the, the capital or the image or representation, but, but as an image. So it is, it, is, it is a site where production itself comes to the, to the eye in the form of an image. So to answer the question, what is a photograph? I think the answer is, it's a rhizome. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's a rhizome. Sarah, can you say who you are and then? Sure. Uh, I'm Sarah Mann O'Donnell. I'm from Northwestern University uh, studying at SSS um, fellowship this year. In Paris. In Paris. Um, I was one, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask. Just one. One. Uh, uh, speaking of jumping off points, I was it seems to me that in uh, Deleuze's uh, articulation of series uh, and the serial, um, especially starting with the logic of sense, uh, that he would in no way refuse the photograph, um, what seems to me an inevitable uh, proliferation um, of 
an inevitable proliferation of what you're calling jumping points or jumping off points, um, production, proliferation, etc. Um, so I was wondering, uh, moving, jumping from the uh, difference in repetition to the logic of sense, I just uh, lost my thought. Jump, uh, jumping from, from difference in repetition to the logic of sense, would your... <coughs> Would the issue that you take with Deleuze's treatment or non-treatment of the photograph be um, the side, uh, the side of the Mobius strip that the photograph would fall on, or do you feel like there is a you know the side of, of Deleuze's sort of dichotomy, which is supposed to smooth out into a univocal surface? W would your issue with Deleuze and that that the next book be uh, where the photograph would fall as corporeal, for example, um, or do you think it transforms, or do you think it continues to be, or begins to be ignored? Well, it's interesting, and I think you are absolutely right. There is actually one place in Logical Sense when Deleuze talks about Mobius' uh, strip and about uh, Alice in Wonderland and photography all in one sentence, and he says, well, Lewis Carroll himself was a photographer, so he kind of and mathematician, and that's really the only place where I think Deleuze allows photography this raisonomatic existence. But in many other texts, for instance, in uh, Thousand Photos, they always use photography as a, as a bad example. Mm -hmm. They say, they kind of say, well, you know, a diagram is like photograph, but what we are more interested in is in theater and dance. And um, so the question of exactly what he said, he thinks about photography is quite an open one because he really didn't say much about it. Um, but what I'm interested in is, um, is the way, well, it, it seems that, that, that in, in many of the texts, he, uh, photography for, uh, for him and for uh, him and Guattari is very much the, the kind of thing they fight against. It's like a kind of uh, and, in that, and in that sense, that they very much continue the trajectory of photography, for whom photography was very reactionary, mm -hmm. unless it is a montage. Mm -hmm. um, let me just jump yeah. in and say a Mobis strip, for those of you that don't know what that is, is a one-dimensional platform, a one-dimensional environment, um, which I can explain later if you want to know more about. Dan, can you, Dan, and then Jonathan, and then Rob. Dan, can you just say who you are? Uh, I'm Dan O'Hara, and um, uh, oh, it takes a long time. Berlin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Something. But isn't there a singular exception in Deleuze's catalogue essay on Gérard Fromanger, which we ought to bring in here, presumably given that people would know Fromanger as a painter, and though they may not know the Deleuze essay, it would surely be significant because it's specifically on photogenic painting. And it's a singular exception in, in Deleuze, in that Deleuze spent much of his time praising the photogenicity of from Angers paintings. It's also published under the title Hot and Cool in the semi-text collection Desert Islands, so you may have come across it. Away from the pictures, out of context, away from the catalogue there. Do you, do you know the one I'm talking yeah, yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But shouldn't this be, rather than difference in repetition or uh, the logic of sense or really anywhere else, if we want to talk about Deleuze's interpretation of photography, should not this be the starting point? Mm, I think it could be a starting point. Particularly for us. I just mean for us. I don't mean kind of fundamentally. I mean... It could definitely this be group. one starting point, but for me, uh, particularly the chapter uh, Image of Thought is a really interesting starting point for photography because I would like to suggest that imageless thought is a thought that doesn't have a... Image of thought that the Lord is calling for is precisely thought that starts from a photographic image, because it starts from the possibility of repetition, of mechanical repetition that photography puts forward. And in that, for, that's what I'm trying to do is to suggest that, it, that in the photographic image we can see the visual or the aesthetic manifestation of the Lord's image of thought. Uh, a number of questions about definition. I mean, you wound up with the word rhizome, and, and I don't actually know exactly what, what that is. Uh, also, definition of schizophrenia. 
uh, you suggested it um, that it's somehow uh, um, synonymous with the idea of multiplicity, and I think there may be a lot of people working in the area of schizophrenia who take issue uh, with that. You mean clinically or? Yes, absolutely clinically. <coughs> I mean, you know, if you're going to start sliding into scientific language, it'd be, you know, mm-hmm. what would an expert on schizophrenia say? And then, and by all means, answer that. And then Deleuze. And why are we taking issue with Deleuze? Why is it so urgent now? Um, I mean, haven't we? I mean, hasn't what he said How written? Have you beaten him by my mouth? <laughs> no, I don't. Exactly. Why are we just going to leave him alone and move on? Because so many people have actually thought well beyond the definition of photography that you described. That is Deleuze's. And so, why is it so urgent to go back to Deleuze? And, and start taking issue with something that he wrote however many years ago, when you know a lot of people are talking and thinking about photography, you know, you know since then and, and have been taking articles about photography, you know, you know, forwards and engaging with new technologies, etc. I mean, is it really is is dealing with Deleuze and and, and creating a critique of Deleuze now <coughs> still something that we really have to see? It's kind of like a fairly boring thing to do again. I take it as well. Huh? <laughs> 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 well, I think there's nothing wrong with being bored. And uh, it's in any it's just a question of desire. If one has a desire for the birth, then what do we want to, to deal with? It? Uh, for me, the question of difference still has, I think, a lot of political agency. Uh, I think precisely because one, what we see around us is the collapse of representational democracy. So the question for presentation becomes very acute, both aesthetically and ethically and politically, and then one wants to go and see what is the alternative. And I think the difference is the the, the Deleuze alternative to representation. And then what I'm suggesting is that photography might play a sort of interesting ethical part in this new form of non-representational politics. I'm going to, that's, thank you very much. I think that, that this is a good time to make a bit of a break. Are you okay to have one one or two more? Oh, Rob, sorry, I, I always need you off. Two questions. Rob. One of the are you confusing the notion of image with content, or confusing the notion of image with content, which I think is problematic. If, if the content is, content is describable, we then make associations. But if the content is, for example, a piece of light or a piece of Polaroid, you can't identify something per se. So that might be problematic. Another notion is the notion of um, mechanical reproducibility. There are certain methods of photography that cannot be mechanically reproduced at all. If I take an SX70 or a Polaroid, I have a unique object, and the only way of reproducing it is by then recording that object again to become something significantly different. So you do the some photographic te- the techniques for you just to run of image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 becomes, you know, a Polaroid is a lot of image you expect that if you put it into the oven and bring out a piece of red, or you put it in the freezer and bring out a piece of blue. Or also, like, if, if for example, you take a piece of Polaroid film uh, and you put a, a light onto it, what do you end up with is a representation of nothing or a representation of light. If you're not saying it's lightning or it's a light, a lamppost or a bulb or yeah. Well, I, I agree that it's, it's, it's very much, of course, the right question than what, you know, how do you define the photographic process? And, uh, and I choose to focus on, on the, the aspect of repetition, which should be engendered in, at least in certain photographic processes. But I think what many photographic processes have in common, even those that are kind of one off, is that they contain this idea of the latent image. So the light doesn't just suddenly, so, so objects don't just suddenly uh, become images through some kind of idealistic process of representation, but there is always in between the latent image, which what, you know, um, Plato will call Cora, and, uh, and Derrida dealt with, it, with this, and Christeva got hold of that idea as well, as the kind of the unknowable form-giving, shape-giving substance. So you cannot just go directly from in from object to image without passing through some kind of element of difference. Okay. So I'm still thinking about the notion of content and image. And so well, the question of content, I'm not sure about it, but, but isn't that part of kind of thinking around form 
and uh, um, and I think well, of course, you know, but but when we when we when we talk about an image, and that's a, I think you are absolutely right. First, no one really knows what an image is, but then what do we look at? Do we look at what is inside the picture? Do we look at the edges? Do we look at how it came to be? Do we look at what will will come after it? All of these things are somehow contained within the idea of the image. And the more we move into technological kind of universality, the more it becomes complex. Um, so I think even the question of content becomes quite complex as well. Isn't frame or edge part of the content as well? You know, the passepartout, as Derrida says. I mean, it just just to comment on Jonathan, uh, and just to clarify, because Jonathan may not be the only one that doesn't know about rhizome. For those of you that are gardeners, um, of which I am not, but I live with a gardener, so I have a sense of it, um, things that are rhizomes don't have roots. They spread, uh, they, they kind of spore, they spread, with it, they spread on the surface, like grass or something is a rhizome. Um, and the idea is, I think that what you're getting at, is that the photograph has for so long been uh, the exemplar of a representational scenario of some kind, and now it may also be a representational scenario, but it has broken through that and is now also, I guess, an event or it's a it's a it's a moment, a slice, something like that. And um, and so, I, just just to clarify that that side of it, I don't know if that helped. <laughs> no, I'm now. sure. I, I, I can't have been the only one. <laughs> no, you were not the only one. Absolutely not, Sarah. I, I just wanted to ask a question. I mean. Really, in terms of somebody like Christaver, does does the photograph have the ability to capture the core, which is which is the, the what's in front of the camera with no meaning? So is that is that is there an, always an element in the photograph which is unease about what we see because it has the ability to capture what was there, which isn't an image. It's not an image because it doesn't have a meaning. Well, I think you're right, yeah. I mean, there is always something unknowable in the photograph that, 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 that is the possibility of it coming into being. Which, so when, I think when we say, what is a photograph, um, the question that has, has nearly always been tried to be answered is what, what we see and not what it is. So, and, and what interests me, actually, is what is the relationship between the two? If, if we understand what does it mean to say we understand what a photograph is and then what is it, its effects, what's the effects of that other layer. So that's what kind of really interests me. And I think mm. that's actually why it's, it's such an important question because so much of the study of photography has been about what we see. And mm -hmm. then maybe you have a study of what it is, but put the two things together and we've actually got, um, it's actually very, it's to do with what you're doing in a way. Then, you know, we've got something, if you put those two things together and you've got something else. Then you get double articulation. You get photography at the edge of, at the edge of chaos. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm, that's that's interesting. Rob Lassen. Yeah. Uh, it's more point. Um, isn't there also a question of the nature of intention of the person creating the work, what they might want the response of the viewer to be? An example would be, um, a shot from Afghanistan as a function that might be a little bit different from something created in a dark room to let's say some sort of emotional responses. And that's a question that's always in the work at some stage. The intention behind the original the original <coughs> technique of the project or the photograph. Yes. And I think that's that's already taking for granted that photography um, contains within this notion of authorship. And which I'm not sure is apply applies to photography at all. Uh, I think it's um, it's precisely an uh, unauthored image. But what I meant by intention was uh, the function of different types of photography and the ultimate usage that they initially will have in some form. You know, if, some, if someone sent off, I just to open up the debate, to a documentary set of photography in Afghanistan for a newspaper, uh, and maybe re-read, recontextualized, analyzed after it in another form, which may be historical or maybe social. But if someone is there, going into a dark room like fossil producing materials, to be of the fine art nature, you know, the intention behind the project or the work probably at some point lies in relation to the content of it or the mark done. Hmm. And you're going to have the last word on this one. Yes? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah, <clears throat> well, it's really a response to um, Sarah's comment to you, Daniel, because it suddenly struck me that um, <laughs> if 
you want to use, um, or if you return to Deleuze as somebody who um, uh, shows us the problem with the Cartesian world and the code of representation, quite honestly, what, what you've been saying is very continuous, though. Mm. with understandings of representation. You know, Barthes would have been happy with what you said, really. Um, and so would John Berger, it seems to me. So I can't quite see. So, it, you know, I'm with you. Sorry, I can't remember your name. Sarah. No. no Jonathan. 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 I'm, I'm with, Jonathan. with him about, you know, why Deleuze now? Because it seems to me, you know, what your presentation kept us in the framework of um, how we read a photograph. Now, without you having to respond yet, I think this is the perfect moment to just summarize a little bit of what's going on, have a five-minute break because there's food out there, and then we're going to have um, uh, Andrea from Finland, uh, Denmark, sorry, Finland, Denmark. I'm so New York. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, sorry, that's really horrible. Uh, Darren uh, from the West Country. <laughs> Darren Newberg. Uh, Darren from uh, BCU. And... Um, and Maggie. Uh, Maggie, would you like to be called from South Africa? Is that fair enough? Uh, London at this yeah. point. Okay. Excellent. So um, can we thank our speakers for the time being? And we'll come back as we're building this argument on what is a photograph. Thank you.